Hello everyone, this is International Master Andrew Martin here and welcome to this promotional video for my Anti-Gambit Guide, the new DVD which is about to be published by Foxy Openings. On this DVD I show antidotes to various dangerous gambits that both white and black can employ. One of which is the Mora Gambit, as we see in our coming game. Now this game was played in the Mainz uh, Rapid Open Tournament in 2007 between Michael Ngele and Super Grandmaster Gata Kamsky playing black. Now it's one thing at club level to SA the Mora Gambit. I would imagine that at this level um, the idea for white can have a great deal of success. But to play against a Super Grandmaster is something very different. And we're going to see a very good method employed by Kamsky in this game which I recommend on the DVD. Now, uh, the method starts with e6, bishop c4, and then e6. All right, now, it's my impression that um, black has several ways to successfully counter the Mora Gambit, but you have to know the ins and outs of the various systems. The nice thing about the system Kamsky is employed doesn't take an enormous amount of um, understanding to be able to play it. You just have to know the basic themes and ideas. The Mora Gambit is a rather formulaic opening. Uh, what normally brings his bishop out to c4 so by putting the pawn on e6 back has placed a brick wall in front of that bishop and then white normally uh, castles but uh, black system is designed to take a lot of the sting out of the white system by delaying the move d6 for the time being and so in this game plays knight g e7 well what is the point of this move okay black is intending to bring that knight to g6 then he wants to control the central dark squares if black gets control of this type, white's attack can run out of steam before, well, it even gets off the ground. So Ngele employs the usual method of trying to tie down that knight manoeuvre by playing bishop g5. But Kamsky now plays b5. And this is another advantage of delaying uh, d6. Playing first, you can often gain a bit of space on the queen side first and get your bishop to b7 before even having to move that d-pawn. And the pawn, the, the power of the pin on the knight to e7 is illusory in this position because white doesn't have any threats. So Ngaili played queen e2 and now he's getting ready to move his rooks to the centre. Rook fd1 and then rook a c1. But now Kamsky shows another uh, very good idea, queen b8. Just getting out of the pin uh, very easily and now intending that knight manoeuvre, knight to g6 when black has good control over f4 and e5. White played rook e1. I mean, that's a peculiar looking move. But um, I think we'll find that the idea of knight g6 followed by developing the king's bishop maybe to c5 is very effective in this position. The ability of black to develop that bishop from f8 in one go to c5, a nice active square, is of course another benefit of having delayed d6. So rook e1 was played. Black played knight g6, black played rook a d1. A slightly different uh, rook layout to the normal... Um, development in this system which places the white rooks on c1 and e1 and now seeing no reason not to play bishop c5 Kamsky played the bishop out to this very active square all right e5 um, white tries to establish a wedge in the black camp um, he wants to play knight e4 and maybe he might he can get in knight d6 then he might get some play uh, h6 backward and if white has got nothing better than bishop c1 then I don't really like his position very much. I think his initiative is already starting to run out of steam. Kamsky's handled the back position in a slightly unorthodox way, and uh, you couldn't say that White have failed to respond uh, correctly, but uh, you know the whole White setup seems ineffective. Well, and Gale came back with Bishop C2, and Kamsky carefully defended his knight with Knight C7, uncovering the power b7 at the same time as long as white can't play knight e4 and then knight d6 in this position black should have very much the better game rook d4 obliges black not to lose time and therefore to take off the knight on uh, c3 and now came the blocking move bishop d5 there's no real way for white to take advantage of black's king in the center in this position so i think we can safely say that black's idea is very flexible and by delaying castling as well as d6, let's say, you know, that can get his pieces to good squares. And white has problems finding a target. 
Well, White decided to activate the Dark Square Bishop. I mean, the Dark Square Bishop is virtually White's only trump in this position. So it makes sense to, to get it onto that diagonal A3, F8. Black handled the threats comfortably with Rook to, uh, Queen to B7. And now come the rather desperate move here, uh, Rook takes D5. I mean, I think Rook takes D5 is sent by White to demonstrate that he actually has the attack when no such attack exists. And Gallet went uh, bishop takes g6 after that, and he followed up with queen e4. So this is really the, uh, a position where black has just to find one good move. If he can find a good move, and Kamsky play the economical king f7, then really there's no white attack to be seen. So knight h4, rook c8, cold-blooded chess. Queen takes g6 check, and now king g8, consists of artificial castling. And you see the problem for white is, his position's falling apart. The bishop on a3 attacks nothing. It's it's bleating on thin air. And all of black species are very safe here on light squares away from the gaze of that bishop. And now it remains to really consolidate black's material advantage. So bishop d1, threatening bishop takes h6. d6, a move better delayed. e takes d6. And now queen f7. Kamsi's very confident in this position that he could beat off White's attack using his queen alone. Of course, White can't trade. Uh, that would leave back easily winning on material. And now comes another very good move here, rook to c4. Rook e4. Well, uh, Ungale couldn't have been happy about playing that move, but of course, queen takes e6 leads to the same um, lost position as before. White, black trades queens and then takes on c3. If queen goes back to the third rank, that can take on c3 with gain of time played but ran slap bang into knight f6 a desperate queen sacrifice was tried but g5 refuted the concept let's go back i suppose if black doesn't have g5 in this position white can claim that he could get some sort of attack with bishop takes h6 g5 it is knight f3 and now queen f5 and really now white is is getting desperate he plays rook in behind. Black uses the queen aggressively, as one should do. Bishop came to d2. And now another very good move here, e5. That pawn can't be taken because of queen d1 check, taking advantage of white's back rank. Rook d5 was answered by e4. And knight e1 by queen takes a2. So a completely cold-blooded play by Kamsky. The grandmaster sees no obvious and direct threats, so he just continues with his own play. Rook d4 was answered by rook d8 by queen e6. Once that pawn on e6, uh, d6 is rounded up, the game really will end very, very quickly. So rook takes d6 was the last move of this game, and Ungale resigned. I think the method with e6 and a6 is very effective against the Mora Gambit, and I'm recommending it uh, using several games on the DVD. Kamsky showed um, a cold heart in this game. He played very well indeed, and he repulsed all of White's threats. For a gambit, it may be dangerous at club level, but when you play against really strong grandmasters, you are taking a serious risk.